Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Pick Cloud Google and Rocket Software, the perfect combination for your disaster recovery solution. My name is Gail, and I'll be your moderator today. First, some general housekeeping items. All of you were muted upon entry. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar via chat, and we will answer them at the end during the Q&A portion as time permits. There are a lot of people on the call today, so if we don't get to your question, we will be sure to respond to you via email after the webinar has concluded. Our presenters today are Mark Pick, President and CEO of Pick Cloud, and from Rocket Software, Brian Glassick, Senior Technical Support Manager, and Brian Cram, Senior Technical Support Engineer. What do all of our speakers have in common, other than the sunglasses? They all have over 30 plus years experience in the multi-value pick market. Without further ado, I'll hand it off to Mark to begin. Mark? Well, thank you, Gail. And welcome, everyone. Um, we've done this uh, presentation once before, and it was very successful, so we thought we'd uh, do it again. So um, sit back and uh, enjoy the presentation here, and then what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at D3 from above, uh, technically how it works and what we're doing, and we'll get into a demonstration, um, an actual live demonstration, and I want to uh, think it's kind of unique because we're going to show a global uh, hot backup uh, live in action. And then, of course, um, your questions. Keep the questions uh, coming in. I know I see a note here. We've got several already, which is great. So I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, and we'll get to the uh, meat and potatoes of the presentation. So let's get started. Um, just quickly, um, you know, about us. I've, we've been doing this now for, uh, oh gosh, um, five years now. And, um, you know, it was pretty obvious that um, cloud computing was going to be here to stay. Uh, and um, it's worked out pretty well. And we've gone down a different routes, a couple different routes. We started working with some hosting companies, and then we realized that we're, there were some other cloud companies out there that we needed to take a look at, and we were approached by um, Google Cloud, and uh, we started to take a closer look at that, as well as Amazon and Azure from Microsoft. So just a couple things that we do. Um, Obviously, we're all about going from on-prem and into the cloud. We um, really encourage people to have backups or store backups in the cloud. Um, security is one of the utmost important things for, for us, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then, of course, one thing that we do a lot of that people don't realize is we, we can provision a server in a matter of minutes and have people testing servers. That's one thing. That's the beauty of the, having this uh, servers in the cloud is that we can provision them. People use them for, you know, two or three days or two or three weeks or two or three months. And um, when they're done, they're done. We, we get rid of it and they move on. So they don't have to invest in a bunch of equipment. Some of the things that we don't do, I've to I'm completely out of the hardware business. I don't do any of that stuff. Um, the last thing that I want to do is throw the baby out with the bathwater, which is, you know, our pick, our, our pick system. We want to continue to preserve and rejuvenate. And uh, like it says here on the, on the slide deck, we don't discriminate. So we work with whether you're Universe, D3, um, we, we love having you. And our partners, you know, obviously Google was a, a key ingredient to that, as well as Rocket Software um, is, you know, being a, a key partner that makes this uh, happen. So let me just back up a little bit and talk about um, the evolution of, of the backup. And this is where I kind of got introduced to, to the computer business, is when you guys all know who my dad is, who started this, uh, this uh, environment. And um, he used to bring home these uh, IBM uh, cards, which were um, a crack up to me because he always said, you know, don't mess with this stuff, don't get them out of order, don't do anything like that. And I didn't know at the time, but that's, you know, that's where the backups were kept. The programs were stored on these cards, which is pretty interesting. So if you look at the era of the, the multi-value space, um, you know, we're backing up these ser servers onto magnetic, magnetic tape as well as, you know, then, of course, the floppy and then the smaller tapes 
that came out. So we went from half inch tape to floppy to quarter inch tape. Then we went to some of the DAT tapes, the DDS tapes. And today we're still doing a lot of this, you know, DLT tapes um, as we progress through and even on to, you know, some of the smart cards that are out there. We can, you know, pick what's so efficient. We can store all this data and, uh, you know, have it readily available. Now, of course, today, a lot of people are doing cloud storage and we you know we got it we started looking at that too hey it makes sense why can't we just store our data in the cloud so if you look at a lot of the the top players out there that came out into this uh into this space of course drop dropbox one drive and of course our one of our favorites is google drive so it's pretty easy to do that um and it's key to have a good backup if you're not doing that today, I encourage you to store your uh, backups off-site. Um, that's one thing that we want to do. So, again, back to when we looked at this, we needed to, you know, work with someone who was going to be around for a while and who, you know, who are the top managed cloud service providers. So, if you look at them, you guys are all familiar with the Gardner Group. You know, they're the research and advisory firm that goes out and analyzes a lot of the uh, IT stuff that goes on out there. And, you know, they do this once a year. This happens to be the one from last sum summer. And you can see here that the growth in this uh, space is, is incredible. It's continuing to grow. Um, if you can, you can see here, we obviously chose Google and we looked at we looked at all three of them. Like I said before, we did work with some other hosting companies, but they were kind of more of a one, you know, one shop. They didn't have a lot of, they didn't have a global presence. So this was key in the in three that we looked at. And we ended up choosing Google platform because when it came down to um, testing and the, our biggest concern was latency, you know, how quickly can we, um, you know, pull up our data, how how quick was the internet going to be? So it was pretty obvious that, you know, Google has been building um, a pretty darn good infrastructure. I mean, they're all about being secure, open, intelligent, transformative. It's, there's no question about that. So, you know, the, the challenges that the, the multi-value community has is letting go of um, their servers and entrusting someone to do that. And that's where we kind of fit in with Google and Rocket. Let us help you with that. You know, um, I always say to people, uh, you know, are you a server hugger? And, you know, people chuckle or they think I'm making fun. You know, you know I'm not really making fun. It's just that it's a, you know, it's a different mind shift for these people when they start um, giving up control of that because they immediately think that, you know, their um their job is at risk or you know they they're losing control it's you know i'm not going to be as secure it's a job security thing but no what i want to do is we want to help you with that to get you um away from the on-prem and move you into a uh, secure environment like um, google cloud that allows us to do that so and you know this guy todd nielsen he um i saw that in wired uh Wired magazine, I think it is that publishes that, but it's just so true. Um, we we tend to to hang on to that because we we think we're losing control, but we are we're taking that burden off of you, so you don't have to worry about maintenance on the hardware. You don't have to worry about updates on the hardware. Um, you, you know, if a drive goes bad, a memory card goes bad, the CPU, you know, all that is all self healing in our environment. You know, that's why we can say ninety nine point nine 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 percent that we're going to be up. So. Um, it's it's incredible how that how that's working today and how they're doing that. So let's let's you know talk about why you want um, you know uh, a secondary server if you're still on prem. If you're on prem, you need to really look at this. Uh, we look at some of the facts that are out there. Um, you know the, these are the things that are happening right now. Um, this this is real world stuff, and I'm going to show you some of this stuff. Um, there's a, there's a lot of not, you know, nat, natural disasters, human error. Um, there's all sorts of things and I want to take you through that. So, and this, and, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about costing you money and being down 
and how, you know can you afford to be down you know what happens so let's take a, a a quick poll here just to see i want to see if anybody does have a um uh let's see if i can do a poll here i don't think i can show this poll i don't see it on my um screen here so uh oh, okay i have it sorry Thank you, Gail, for passing that over to me. So I'm gonna, let's see if any of you guys have, we're just gonna do a quick poll here. Um, and if you could just click on, you know, do you guys have a, a disaster recovery plan in place? You know, uh, and just go ahead and hit submit. <clears throat> I see the votes coming in. I'll wait till it, uh, it's, it stops here. Um, Oh, we're getting good good percentage here. So, but this is this is really 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 key. Um, even if it's a you know my disaster is to go out and you know get a new server and and reload my data, that's fine. Um, but that may take a couple days to do that. But at least you're getting your your backups off site. So okay, let's close the poll and let's show the results of this poll. Um, Wow. Okay. Good. 66% of you say that you have, you know, you have a recovery plan in place, which is great. Some of you don't. Um, shame on you. You need to, to get that. Um, and of course, you guys are working on it. And if you're working on it, hopefully you're talking to us and we can help you with that. So let's move on here. Um, this one is near and dear to my heart because we have a customer uh, that was affected by this natural disaster here. Uh, over on the Big Island, um, just outside of Hilo, uh, Kilauea, which erupted. You guys have probably seen this on the news. And it, it's so funny because I was just there five months ago, and it was quiet as can be. And you can see that with the uh, volcano, not only did the volcano, it, it, it did happen in a rural area, but there were earthquakes. And there were earthquakes. There was, you know, now the volcano is, you know, spewing out and making its way down into some residential areas and some power plants where we had uh, power outages. So we have a customer over in Hawaii that has a major office in Hilo. And um, the only effect that they had from this was power outage, but they could all uh, go back remotely and still connect to our server, which is in our data center. So they weren't affected, they, the office was affected here and there with power. So um, they were able to work. Now, this one here, we had some clients, you know, last summer, the end of the last summer, um, we had the, the trifecta here, Katya, Irma, Jose, they all, these hurricanes that all happen. I mean, we don't see this very often, but we had clients in Florida that were affected by this, um, that were shut down, that had water damage. Um, this kind of stuff happens, you know, just like the blackout in 2003. I think a lot of you that um, that are on the East Coast, you can see that the blackout occurred for, for a while. And if your server was on-prem, which it was for a lot of you, you could not function at all and none of the, your remote sites could connect. So, um, and that was a huge, huge uh, uh, effect on a lot of people. And this one, of course, you've heard me talk about this. If you've seen any of my presentations, um, this is uh, kind of near and dear to close to me because of uh, the people in this building, if you look in the, the right-hand picture of this uh, picture here, is the Northgate Reality. Our, our good friends over at uh, Northgate Reality were affected by the Bunsdale, uh fire and explosion. That's where they had their servers and all of their reality documentation. All that was gone. Um, thankfully, they had a, a, a backup uh, in a different location. But And I don't know how current it was, but these things happen. Um, and, you know, that's one thing you'll find that a data center is never going to be next to an oil refinery. That's not um, part of the plan. So, but these things do happen. There's the, you know, the security breach, you know, this could happen to anybody. Um, so you got to be, be aware of that. Uh, and then, you know, then there's the human error. What happens, you know, when um, you have human error? You know, that accounts for almost 19% of the problems that may occur on your server. So, you know, it's your, don't be a homer. You know, we've had, we had a situation where uh, the, the cleaning people came in, they were doing the server room, 
you know, they had a nice server room. It gets clean once in a while. The, they accidentally unplugged um, their complete network and caused an outage. Uh, they had data corruption and things like that. Um, so you don't want Homer um, in your data center, that's for sure. And then let's look at, you know, here's one that wasn't, it was fairly um, recent too, um, bad hardware. Uh, they had a, a disk drive outage, okay? And of course, they let their, they let their maintenance expire on their D3. And, you know, that's not a good thing to do. They only had, you know, one backup tape that was, you know, hopefully we, we could read, uh, read that tape and restore their data onto a server and get them um, back up. And it took, took us, I think, almost two, two and a half days, and it cost them $10,000 a day just because they weren't prepared for their, for their disaster. So just another quick question. Um, I'm going to ask a couple questions here. Uh, do you guys keep a uh, backup copy um, off site? You know, do you um, go ahead and vote? And, you know, this is important, whether it's I have a service that comes by and takes my backup and stores it off site in a secure location. Maybe I take a copy of that off site. Uh, maybe I push a copy up to uh, something like a, a pick cloud environment where I know that I can get to it. Okay. Um, so I think you guys are almost done voting there. So let's go ahead and close the poll. You guys have all nearly 100% of you have voted. So I'm going to close the poll and let's share those results. Good job, people. Um, over 90% of you um, keep your backup in a different location, which is good. Very good. Okay. Um, and then poll number three. This is the one that is really um, uh, key is, you know, when's the last time you tested this thing? Uh, you know, um, let's launch this poll. I wanna, I'm curious to know here. You know, when was the last time you fully tested your disaster recovery plan? And what I mean by that is completely coming off your production machine and knowing that you can go um, onto your backup machine and be fully functional, not lose any functionality at all. This is one that often gets overlooked. Yeah, I'm storing my backup copy. I'm taking my backup tape. I'm storing it. But have you tested that tape? Did you restore from that tape? Did you restore onto a new machine? Were you able to function? Those are some of the things that um, you need to test, all right? Okay, a couple more people coming in. Um, and this, this, this is the one that you really need to pay attention to. So let's go ahead and close that poll and share those results. Okay, and, and this is what I'm afraid of. You know, a lot of you never even had done it, and some of you are required. Maybe you have some sort of compliance with your company that you have to do it every 30 days, which is good. I don't know if that's overkill, depending on your business and how, how much can you afford to be down, but the fact that you're doing it every six months or once a quarter, once a year is a good thing, but to never do it, mm, you, should, you should, you know, check that out sometimes, so. All right. So now let's let's talk about what we're going to do today. What we're what we're going to do today is um, we're going to demonstrate hot backup in the cloud and how it works. And you guys have all heard me talk about the Google Cloud infrastructure and how big it is and powerful and all that. Just keep in mind that the data that we um, that we're going to move about here is moving about through Google's private fiber network. Okay, a lot of you don't realize that that. Google's network is all internal fiber across submarine cable and all that kind of stuff. There's no other um, uh, company, hosting company out there that can claim this. So we, um, we can move data pretty quickly and we want to demonstrate that how we have a, a cloud server in, um, this happens to be in Oregon, and then we're going to move that data over to um, the UK and then for, for grins, we're going to have a tertiary server and move it down to Australia, which is pretty incredible when you think about it. We're going to be doing updates on our, our, on our production, say we'll, we'll call it the primary server in the U.S., and then you know push it across 
over to the UK and then down to Australia. So we're pretty much covering the, the planet here and doing that. We want to show you the power of um, D3 hot backup as well as the, the power and speed of Google's infrastructure. So with that, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, hand it over to um, Brian Glassick and he's going to give us that, that uh, 50,000 foot view. And then I think from there we'll go down to um, Brian uh, Cram and he's going to give us a, a demonstration. We'll come back to me and we'll wrap it up. So, all right, Brian, I'm going to hand it off to you. Okay, Brian. Brian, I think you need to unmute your phone. You hear me? Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Okay. Can you see my screen? We can. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to talk about Hot Backup today, and the whole concept between uh, behind Hot Backup is just that. It's a it's a secondary uh, server. It's uh, duplicated uh, the primary server, and it's and it's kept up to date uh, by the minute uh, as updates are being done on the the primary server. The the updates are are being sent over to that secondary server, and it's and uh, it, it's kept up to date. Uh, it's fully licensed, uh, and uh, so that in the event of a, of a failure on the primary server, uh, all your users, uh, there's, no, there's nothing that needs to be done about activating a second server or getting it licensed or whatever. It's, it's already licensed and it's already ready, ready to go for your, uh, your full user load. So, what we're going to kind of go over uh, today is just the the kind of the high level architecture of of hot backup and what you need to kind of think about when you're setting up a uh, hot backup in your environments um, and a little bit of the you know just testing and as Mark said we'll we'll be doing a little bit of a demonstration uh, towards the end of it so. Hot backup uses the same queue mechanism as the you know transaction logging to tape. Uh, so if you're using transaction logging to tape, you you got to choose one or the other. Uh, the the hot backup is far superior to, to logging to tape because, like I said, it's it's the updates are going over, you know, in the now. So you can test or check that secondary server uh, whenever you want to. Where the tape is, you got to rely on, uh, you know, undoing the tape and, uh, you know, maybe restoring a secondary system. And, and there's some uh, there's some lag time there. Uh, it relies on two processes. Uh, each system uses uh, a phantom process. And the primary server will push the updates over to the secondary server, which on that secondary server, there will be another phantom as well that's pulling uh, the updates across. The communication between the two servers is done over a TCP port that uh, can be configured. Whenever you're configuring hot backup, you need to make sure that that backup machine is equal to the primary machine. For for a true hot backup uh, disaster recovery solution to work, um, that backup system needs to be able to handle that same user load uh, and and the the computing capacity that the, that would be going on in the primary. Uh, in the early days of hot backup, we'd have people who would uh, skimp and, you know, they would put in, they'd have an old server that they would retire and set up hot backup between their new faster server and this, uh, you know, this old slower server. And if you really had to fail over to it, that, that backup server might not be able to handle that the same way the primary would. Uh, there are some things that you need to consider when you're going through your application uh, to make it hot backup friendly. One of the things that you want to think about is uh, if you've got work files that 
uh, are used within your application, th those files normally don't need to get logged, and you'd want to uh, not log those files. Um, just so you don't send, you're not sending, you know, unneeded uh, updates and data over that uh, that connection. Uh, the other thing too is those uh, phantom processors are normally all running out of the DM account, so you know anything like translates on indexes and uh, you know call X's uh, programs uh, that you have triggers should all be fully passed. Um, now, one of the things to consider also is normally on the backup system, however, we're not going to run triggers. Um, and there is a command to turn triggers on and off. And you would turn those off on the backup server just because normally what a trigger is usually doing is it's doing a, maybe an update to some audit or secondary files that you don't want the actual trigger firing on the backup system. You want the actual update uh, to that secondary or or audit file to come over as it was done on on the master. Um, and then there's a couple different ways that you can configure hot backup. Um, you uh, you can either log all files and then you mark your your files with the set DPTR to uh, mark the ones that you don't want to log, or you say, hey, I'm, I'm only want to log certain files, and you would mark those files uh, as a DL to uh, say these are the files that are being logged, which is uh, what most people usually do. But it it can it can go either way depending on how much work it it, it would be to to mark them you know, to log certain files or to just, just to log other, all files and mark the ones you don't want to log. So once you have uh, your two systems, what you're going to do is you're going to do, um, you're, you're going to have a D3 installed on each system. You would have a unique system ID for both systems, uh, one designated as a, a backup of the other. Uh, and you're going to, um, Start in queuing uh, transactions uh, while you do your save. And that way, so any update that might happen if users are on while that save is going is going to get queued into the queue while that save is running. You take that save over to your secondary server and you're going to uh, restore the accounts on that secondary server. At that point, you can create a, a master server on your primary. Now, when we talk about the, the master server and the slave server, we don't necessarily uh, are meaning the actual machine. It's actually, you know, the server is a process. It's, it's that phantom process that is, you know, communicating to the other phantom process over that TCP port and uh, transferring that data over. Um, when you start the servers, any updates that have been enqueued during that file save, they're automatically going to get dequeued over to the backup system. So you would basically just um, start the hot backup process on the primary, start it on the secondary. And some of the things that you can do to test uh, whether hot backup is working is on your you know, secondary system, you can clear a file, and we have a command uh, in D3 uh, called touch, which will go through a file and basically, you know, do an update on that file, send it through an update item, not necessarily change the item, but put it into the queue because it thinks there's been an update. And those transactions will go over and then you can use count and checksum to verify that you know that the data is there and it's uh, the same. Now one of the things that you got to do uh, is 
you can't just set up hot backup and think, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm done with it. I'm, it's just going to run and I don't have to worry about it. I mean, it, it is, uh, there are updates going into this queue. And if for whatever reason that pipe gets broke or something goes wrong between those two servers uh, communicating, that queue can back up. Now that queue is going to consume uh, overflow or D3 disk space. And if it's left unchecked, you could run your system out of disk space. So these are the things that you kind of want to do to um, monitor hot backup. A lot of people who run hot backup uh, to date you know they've written their own utilities that uh, is monitoring these thing these things and uh, can uh, alert them via emails and other such things that you know there there might be something going on. Like I said, uh, hot backup. The two servers are going to run as phantoms. So a couple you know things that you can do uh, is to if, if something's not working is to, you know, use where list jobs, see if those phantoms are running. But what I find the most useful, especially in support when somebody's calling and they're having an issue with hot backup is starting the server in the foreground. Like I said, by default, the servers are going to run in the background as a phantom. Uh, but there is an option that you can uh, start the server in the foreground and it, gives you very useful information on what's going on. And, it, and it's usually right away where you see it's like, hey, I can't open this file or whatever. And you and it and it triggers you that, oh, yeah, I, I've got something that's not uh, fully pathed or or something like that. The mechanism to filling over, this is kind of a, obviously if your primary system goes down, um, you're not going to be able to log off your users from the primary. You're not going to be able to turn dequeuing off um, and, and all those things. This is uh, more of what Mark was talking about earlier is, you know, testing, you know, your hot backup solution. And so in testing it, you would you would do a controlled failover. Uh, you, you'd get the users logged off. You can turn dequeuing off on that primary system. And then you want to ensure that the queue is empty. Uh, to make sure that you know every update that was done is over uh, on your secondary server, uh, which, uh, as I stated earlier, normally you would run with CallX off. Uh, you would turn CallX on to make sure that you know that that triggering mechanism that you might have within your application is is functional. You then do a simple little DNS uh, change, you either change your server name or your IP address, however you need to do it and your users can reconnect. And if you've got the whole uh, DNS server set up right, they, they don't even know they're on a, a, another system. So here's some additional resources that uh, you can look at for hot backup. Uh, the, the main uh, documentation for hot backup is in the D3 Unix uh, system administration guide as is noted there. Hot backup is cheaper than uh, any kind of trying to rebuild disk. And uh, like I said, if if you've got that whole uh, hot backup thing set up, it's, it's up to date by the minute. And, uh, you know, users can remember what they did just a few minutes ago. They're, they're not going to be able to remember what they've done for a whole day. Um, the other good thing about the the hot backup server, like I said, it's up and live. Uh, you can use it to do your saves uh, or any type of other reporting uh, processes that you know you can offload that uh, onto that secondary server. And uh, here is all my disclaimer, <laughs> and that's it. Now you tell us. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> and, all right. Um thank you Brian for that uh view. Um now let's let's go over to uh Mr. Cram and he's going to Are you going to show us that or Uh well, I was going to uh just kind of give you a brief kind of the oh, how it looked from from D3. So uh Mark has uh 
set up these two servers. Uh, uh, like you said, one in the U.S. Actually, three, but I'm I'm just going to deal with the the two, uh, the U.S. Uh, and the U.K. And uh, I've marked them with different colors under Mark's direction, so that you kind of could uh, get the feel that we are on two different servers. Uh, So normally your your configuration for hot backup is all going to be done within the DM account. Uh, it's run uh, just a simple command called hot backup that brings you into the menu. And this is where you would do all your setting up and you can do some of your monitoring here. Uh, we've got these two servers uh, processes already set up. I'm just going to kind of give you a kind of a brief overview on the uh, the different uh, things that you need to think about when you're defining it. So you're just going to give it a name. The name is just to help you keep, you know, the processes separate. You would define whether that process is going to be a master server or a slave server. And you'll kind of see, you know, the importance of that when Brian uh, Cram goes into the kind of the tertiary configuration there. You give it the host name that you're going to communicate to and the TC port number. Now, 2000 is our default, uh, but that again can be totally uh, configurable. You're gonna give it the, the, the virtual machine name, uh, which is the configuration file for that D3 virtual machine environment. And just a couple different other timeout uh, options that you can give that uh, I, I've really found no need to ever tweak those. So, and similarly, you, you have that on the uh, backup server. And I went into the wrong one. Sorry about that. So this is the slave server to our primary, and you, you notice it doesn't reference that that master at all. It just it's just uh, all you have to do is is give it the proper uh, TCP port that that uh, that master server is going to going to come in on. And so, uh, like we said, uh, we've got. Uh, These servers run in the in the in the background as phantoms. So this uh, this secondary server is also acting as a primary uh, for uh, that third or tertiary uh, hot backup system. So that's why you see the two uh, the phantom jobs running. But the one that we're mainly concerned about uh, for this one is the uh, one that's running on PIB 14, the hot backup. Uh, dot slave. And we have the same thing over here, but we have that master server. And so what I was going to do is just come, uh, come over here uh, to our SQL demo account. and kind of give you let you look at see what the files that we have out here on the secondary system and we've got hot backup configured now so that it's only going to log uh files that we mark for logging so those when we uh create that file we're going to give it the the l option so that it it creates that file with a, a dld pointer and any updates to that file will uh, we'll go over. So you can see the list of files here. You notice that there is not a file that uh, out there called BG test. So I'm going to create a file over on the master. Called BG test. And I'm going to make it kind of undersized right now. 
and I forgot to create it with the L option, so I'm going to say I want this file to be logged by setting the D pointer to be DL'd. You can see now that over on the backup system, that file is there, and it's there already. Um, I'm just going to copy some data over there. Uh, it's copied over 5,000 items into that file. And if I count that file right now, th that data is already there. Uh, anything that I can do on a regular file I can um, I can do over uh, it, it will it will send that over uh, the transaction to the backup system I can create an index now and if I come over here You can see that the index is there already and it's created. I can clear the file. I can delete the file. Uh, any any update I do to that that file will will uh, will go over. And and I guess at that I will hand it over to to Brian. Thanks, Brian. All right, Mr. Cram. Good morning. How are you, Brian? I am well. Okay. So, uh, what I'm really going to talk about is the differences between the uh, secondary and tertiary, and show you uh, show you what happens in a cascade. So, uh, you guys see my screen? Yeah, we see your sunset. Yeah, it's a beautiful sunset. I've got a couple of screens here. This is my USA server, as you can see. Says it's USA. Um, show this. Show the server that Brian just went through. So let me get the. Uh, let me get the UK over here. And select the correct one. Don't do what Brian did. And this is, you can see the back one. You can see this one's listening. They're they're using uh, port 2000. But if I bring over a uh, secondary instance of the UK server, you see that I've also got the a primary set up. And that's uh, doing pick zero, but you notice the difference here is it's on 2001. The Australian server here, Yeah, well, it had to be kind of funny, I guess. So, I, you I see that these two are are talking on 2001, where the first pair between the primary and secondary are uh, talking on PC port 2000. And you'll also notice that the slave server on the um, on the first pair log slave log slave updates is on, whereas this one I have it off because I don't want to logging updates that aren't going anywhere. I'll chew up disk space in no time. With that, I've got a, um, I got a little program here that I'm going to use. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate, I'm, I'm going to quickly generate a file on the master and I'm going to, we're going to time I could type I could be somebody so I've got a I've got a program out there called big file I'm going to throw 2,000 records in it right there but I've got a program that just sits there and waits for record one and waits for record 2,000 it shows when it got it right now I've cleared that file over on the uh, on the secondary and tertiary so that you can see so that it will wait for that first record and over here I'm going to gen that file
and then in England, it just got record one. It just got record 2,000, and over in Australia, it just got record one. It just got record 2,000 right there. That was less than 10 seconds to go all the way around the globe. That's pretty good. It sure is, it's, it's a heck of a lot better than restoring from tape. Um, and um, that's all I've got, really. So, Brian, so uh, Mr. Pick, if you would take it back. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, that's uh, that's that's pretty uh, pretty impressive. Um, again, uh, you know the power of the network, how we're moving um, data all over the place like that. So, um, so we got a lot of questions, but I just wanted to go through because we did have some questions on pricing, um, just real quick, and then I want to get to the questions because you guys have asked a lot of great questions. So. Basically, the the pricing um, pretty simple. It's 75% discount uh, list price, so it comes out to about $164. Um, obviously, you got to have a contract in place to make this all happen, and the licenses must match uh, the. So, if you have a 64 user license, you need a 64 user backup license. You can't say I want a 64, my primary 64, but I, you know, if I go to hot backup, I only need 16. No, it's got to be a one for one match on that. That's a, a requirement that's put in place here. This will probably answer a lot of questions that have come up because um, we, I've seen a few come in before on the environment. So if I have a Windows um, backup, say it's on prem and I want to back up to what we're showing on a Linux environment, no, it's got to, and the guys will correct me if I'm wrong, but it needs to, to match the environment. So if it's Windows, it's got to be Windows on your backup and vice versa, just like Linux, Unix, it's got to be the same uh, host environment um, to be able to make that work, okay? So the cost of the, the server, we have different types of servers that we have out there. Um, I'm not going to bore you too much with that, but that's the monthly fee on, on those. So, um, let me uh, get to some of the questions here that have that has come in. I think I answered the question on the on the Windows uh, backup. One of the the questions, you know, how how quickly can we implement this, um, you know, um, strategy? Well, fairly quickly. I mean, we can provision a server in a matter of hours, and it's just um, you know getting your latest file save tape, you know, restoring it and setting up the hot backup. So. You know, we've done these, you know, when we worked in a, you know, kind of a Chinese fire drill where we had to do it pretty quickly, we obviously got it done in less than 24 hours to get you up and, and, and going. But um, to schedule it, it doesn't take long at all. You're, we're only really um, bound by how quickly we can get your full backup on the other server and then start to um, DL the files that are going to need to be updated. So it works uh, fairly quickly. Um, does my primary server need to be in the cloud for this to work? Um, no, it no, it doesn't. You can have, you know, we have clients that have a hot backup server on premise. Now, is you know, in the beginning, I I don't encourage you to do that because what if that disaster happens? What if you lose power? What if um, there's a catastrophic event in your data center? So you know, on-prem, you need, you want those servers. That The whole purpose of this presentation was to show how the servers can be, you know, 10,000 miles apart and be up to date instantly. And that's what you want to do. So you want to avoid having um, your hot backup on-prem. Um, at least I would, I would do that. Um, uh, let's see. See, if I start using my hot backup server, will I incur additional fees? The only fees that I talked about are the fees for the license, and then in our situation, the fees for the server. So that's a monthly. It could, it could be as low as $299 a month for the server, which is all the infrastructure to run that, and all the updates and all that stuff are going to be on there. So um, security. This is a, a one that comes up. What kind of sec security standards do you employ for protecting my data. Well, we, we take that um, pretty, uh, pretty seriously. So the great thing about um, being in the Google Cloud is all of the data that is transmitted is all encrypted internally. So you could say, well, what happens if I have my um, on-prem server and I'm transmitting that data up 
to the cloud, is that going to be secure? And the answer to that question is, well, we're going to uh, probably put in a virtual private network so that data will be secure on that um, communication. So, um, yes, the data will be secure. Um, but out of the box, D3 just runs natively over that port, so you, you would be subject to um, uh, a security risk there. But we don't encourage that. In fact, we don't even set them up, up that way if you do come into the into our cloud. So um, I talked about the the like for like environment. That that's by probably the third time I've got that question. Um, what sort of uh, disaster recovery drills do you recommend to ensure the switch over is seamless? You give it a try. Um, uh, fire up a, a hot backup server in the cloud. Um, we'll provision it for you, set it up, and then do the switch over. And if you want to, you know, you can do it over a weekend, take a look at it, make sure all your data is there. But, you know, don't forget that when you do move into a hot backup environment, you've got to think about everything. You know, what about your your third party uh, vendors maybe that you deal with that rely on something that is not there anymore? Um, printing, you know, are you still printing the old traditional way from the spooler? You got to make sure that you have that in place too. So we have, you know, we take into account everything um, that you have. Um, the uh, someone asked uh, off topic here, universe backup. Can I host a universe backup in your cloud? Absolutely, um, we encourage that as well. Um, we're not just bound by um, D3 here. So universe, we're all welcome uh, in that. Um, someone asked a question about the the, the cost. Um, again, it's $164 per user. That's the maintenance that you're going to pay. It's the the maintenance that you pay on the user there, and then you're going to have the monthly cost on the server, the server that you're going to have in the cloud, and that could be as little as $299 a month. So, um, uh, a question came up. I don't know what ITAR uh, compliance is. Maybe if you can elaborate more on that, I can answer that um, question. So oosh, we, we need to get rolling here. So, um, oh, here we go. Uh, let me tell you what we can do um, today is you know to get you guys started because you guys are asking a lot of questions about that so what we're what we're going to do here is um, for those of you that want to try this because we got a lot of questions about people wanting to try it we can go ahead and um, I'll work with rocket rocket has allowed me to, to um, give you a license here we'll do a 30 day free in the cloud so basically what that means is we'll get you set up you'll work with uh, with us to get you set up, get the hot backup uh, deployed, won't cost anything. You know, this offer will be in play for all the people uh, on the call. If you want to, you know, recommend this to somebody, um, Rocket and myself, along with Google, will um, provision this server up and we'll waive all the, the fees and stuff like that. But you need to do this um, before the end of uh, June there. And, um, you know, you can take advantage of that. So that's a that's a pretty good Pretty good offer, um, and I think we answered most of those questions. Um, I'm looking at my moderator here. Just a couple more have come in. Um, I answered that one. I think that's. Uh, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Um, just final thoughts. Um, you know, I, I tell people, you know, you guys are using the cloud already um, a lot with your email. That was probably one of the first things that moved over. Uh, people started to re rely on that. There's no reason why you can't um, have your database in the cloud too. Um, and like like I said, the server, the hot backups can be um, put together fairly quickly. Um, and you don't want to be caught. You don't want to be caught with your pants down with some sort of weird outage or something like that that's going to come up. Um, they, these are easy to easier than you think to set up. So. Again, all of you that were entered into the drawing, you guys, um, we're going to give away um, a Google Home Mini. So congratulations to whoever is going to win that. I'll, we'll find out. You will get an email. So I think that's it. Um, I'm going to do one more scan of the questions here. I think we got most of them done. 
So with that, I would like to thank my uh, presenters, um, Mr. Brian Glassick and Brian and Cram, I thank you for that demonstration. I thought it was pretty powerful how we were able to, to globally set up a D3 hot backup in the cloud. And I will look forward to um, talking to some of you offline that have messaged us uh, offline. So thank you so much. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.